In attempting to explain why the Supreme Court accepts some cases for review more than others, some political scientists subscribe to a theory known as Q theory. And Q theory posits that the court has a lot of work to do and not much time to do it. That they've got to sort through 10,000 petitions every year. And so most of those petitions are simply unworthy of review. Um, and that's the assumption that Q theory starts with, that most justices think that most petitions are not worthy of review. And therefore, justices are looking for signals, or what political scientists call cues, about whether a case is worthy or not. And so, what political scientists have done is tried to find if there are certain factors associated with why the court grants cert. Are there certain cues in a case that might make it more likely that they would grant review? And indeed, there are. And in fact, there's one factor that's more important, far more important, than any other factor. And that is, the court is far more likely to grant review when the United States government has asked it to. The U.S. government, when it seeks certiorari, it is often successful. Again, this is the single most important predictor of whether or not the court is going to grant review in a case. And in fact, although most litigants have less than a 1% chance of having the court review their case. When the federal government requests review and it's a litigant, there's a 70% chance the court will grant it. On average, the court grants about 70% of the government's requests to review cases. Why is that? Well, in order to understand why the government is so successful in court, we have to understand the role of an individual known as the Solicitor General. The Solicitor General of the United States is the third highest ranking member of the Department of Justice. They report to the Attorney General. Uh, they serve at will. They must be confirmed by the Senate. So they are a very important member of the Department of Justice. And they have two main responsibilities. First of all, they're responsible for deciding which of the many cases the United States government is involved in, which of those cases to appeal to the United States Supreme Court. And then, once the court has accepted cases for review, the Solicitor General is also responsible for actually arguing those cases in front of the court in their courtroom in Washington, D.C. For now, though, we're going to focus on the first of these, uh, the fact that they decide which cases to appeal to the Supreme Court. Solicitor General operates generally with a high degree of autonomy, and most observers of the office note this fact. The current Solicitor General is Noel Francisco, who's pictured here. The Solicitor General is so important to the court that they're often referred to as the Tenth Justice. They appear repeatedly before the court, obviously, and they appear before the court more than any other attorney, by far. They're the only attorney with an office in the Supreme Court building. Uh, this is a courtesy that the Supreme Court extends to them on account of the fact that they are in the building so frequently. In addition, they're the only attorney who does not have to ask the courts for permission before they file an amicus curiae brief. We haven't talked about amicus curiae briefs, but amicus curiae briefs are briefs that are filed by somebody who's not actually a litigant in the case but who has an interest in the case. It might be a corporation, it might be uh, an interest group, and sometimes it, it's governments. Every other litigant has to get permission from the courts before they can submit an amicus curiae brief. The attorney, Solicitor General does not. So why does the Solicitor General win so often? Why are they so successful at having their cases reviewed by the court? Well, it partially has to do with their experience. They argue in front of the court so frequently that inevitably they learn a lot about the justices' beliefs and procedures. They know very intimately the court's personnel and what kinds of cases might interest them. But probably most importantly, they serve a very, very important gatekeeper function. 
What does the gatekeeper function refer to? Well, every year there are dozens of federal agencies that want to appeal cases to the Supreme Court. There's no shortage of cases from the federal government to the Supreme Court. And it's the Solicitor General who gets to decide which cases the government will actually appeal. And as a result, the Solicitor General, when they go through these cases, they pick only the strongest and most important cases to appeal. In other words, the Solicitor General's already done the court's work for them. This is what granting certiorari is all about, if you'll recall. The court wants to get the most important cases, the most significant cases. And what the Solicitor General's done is he or she has already gone through all of the cases that the federal government has and has weeded out, the weaker ones, has weeded out the less important ones and has only brought the strongest and most important cases. And in fact, the court largely defers to the Solicitor General's judgment. If the Solicitor General says a case is important, then it's probably important. You uh, political scientists have found a second factor uh, that's important in explaining why some cases are granted review more than others, and that is allegations of conflict in the lower courts. Certiorari is more likely to be granted in cases where conflict between the lower courts is alleged. For example, we've already mentioned the Obamacare case. Uh, there was conflict between the lower courts regarding whether the individual mandate was constitutional, and as a result, the Supreme Court accepted that case for review and settled the conflict. So, this is comforting in that Rule 10 is true. Uh, we remember Rule 10 said that the court should be more likely to grant review if there's conflict between various courts, and in fact, that appears to be the case. The third factor that explains why some cases are more likely to be granted review are cases in which the United States government files an amicus curiae brief. If you recall, an amicus curiae brief is filed by a litigant who is not actually part of the case, and non-litigants, including the United States government, can file amicus curiae briefs in support of or in opposition to certiorari. In other words, they can weigh in on whether the court should accept the case for review or not. So even if the United States government is not involved in a case, they can nevertheless file an amicus curiae brief telling the court to either accept or reject the case for review. When the United States files a brief in favor of granting review, that makes granting review more likely. But when the United States files a brief against granting review, that also makes it more likely that the court will hear a case. So it doesn't really matter whether the United States is saying to grant or to reject the case. Either way, merely filing a brief um, makes it more likely the court will accept the case. Why is this? Well, the fact is the United States government doesn't usually file amicus curiae briefs at this point, and therefore any case in which they actually do file an amicus curiae brief indicates that this case must be important and thus it's probably worth granting review for. So the United States government and the Solicitor General would be wise to never file an amicus curiae brief against granting cert, but they occasionally do. The fourth factor uh, is the existence of a brief in opposition. If you'll recall, um, when somebody asks the court to review a case, the other side has an opportunity to file a brief in opposition. The vast majority of the time they do not do this. However, sometimes they do, and this actually works against their own interest because once again litigants who file briefs opposing review actually make review more likely. Because once again, since it happens so rarely, when it does happen it signals to the court that this case is probably important and that it ought to be granted review. Another factor, factor number five, is a non-unanimous decision in the lower court. Non-unanimous decisions from the lower court are more likely to be granted certiorari, and this makes sense because non-unanimous decisions indicate that there was conflict on the lower court, which indicates that perhaps the law is unsettled and perhaps that the case is indeed important enough for the court to decide. And finally, there are a few issues uh, that make the court more likely to accept a case review. Three issues according to 
some research indicate cases that involve civil liberties, cases involving civil rights, and cases involving federalism will be more likely, all else being equal, to be granted review. But, hold on, not so fast. Just because the United States Supreme Court has four members who vote in favor of a case, then certiorari is granted, the court should review it, but it's not a guarantee. Because after granting certiorari, the court can still change its mind. The court, even after it's granted cert, has the ability to dismiss cases as improvidently granted. That simply means we made a mistake. And if they do that, the case is simply dismissed. This doesn't happen very often, but it does indeed happen. Uh, and when it does happen, it's rarely explained. The court rarely explains why they dismissed the case, why they changed their mind. Uh, one example, relatively recently, was the Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics from 2013. This was a biological patent case. It had to do with patenting living organisms, and the court dismissed it after they had granted review, and most observers believe they dismissed it because the case was simply too complicated, and the court didn't really understand the scientific issues that were involved, and so they felt it was better simply to not get involved at all. Finally, there's a vote to grant certiorari, and then the case will be reviewed, and then they will vote on the merits. They'll actually vote to decide the case. So let's compare those two votes, the initial vote to review the case, and the later vote to actually decide the case on the merits. As you recall, the certiorari vote is supposed to be separate from the vote on the merits. But political scientists have found that they are indeed connected because if they were unconnected, completely unconnected, the court would reverse about 50% of its cases and it would affirm about 50% of its cases. But that's not what happens. It varies from year to year, but over time, the court ultimately votes to reverse about 70% of the cases it accepts for review, meaning it is more likely to grant review in cases where it believes the lower court was wrong. And political scientists refer to this simply as the court's error correction strategy. Well, that's it. We've talked about how the court decides which cases it will decide. Next, we'll move on to discussing what happens after the court accepts a case for review.